G'day everyone and welcome back to the 39 steps. When we last left off, we were shocked, shocked I tell you, by the sudden murder of our American spy friend. Sounds like the information he was telling us was not just hot air. Unfortunately, everything points to our valiant hero, Richard Haney, as the killer. So let's see what happens next. In the soup. Dum, dum, dum. Saturday, 23rd of May, 1914, Wimpole Street, London. Yes. We have the unfortunateness of a body with a knife stuck in it. The poor staring white face was more than I could bear. I staggered to a cupboard, found the brandy, and swallowed several mouthfuls, as you would do. I had seen men die violently before. Indeed, I had killed a few myself in the Matabel War. But this cold-blooded indoor business was different. I needed to think. A brutal slaying. I'm an ordinary sort of fellow, not braver than other people, but I hate to see a good man downed. And that long knife would not be the end of Scudder if I could play the game in his place. His enemies had found him and had taken the best way to make certain of his silence. Scudder had been in my rooms for four days and his enemies must have reckoned that he had confided in me. I would be next to go. It might be that very night, or the next day, or the day after, but my number was up alright. Pointless endeavour. Few people knew me in England. I had no real pal who could come forward and swear out to my character. Perhaps that was that was what those secret enemies were playing for. They were clever enough for anything, and an English prison was as good a way of getting rid of me till after June 15 as a knife in my chest. If I told the whole story, and by any miracle was believed, I would be playing their game, and Carolides would stay at home. Which was not what they wanted, which is what they wanted. Mmm, no chance. No chance in hell. Supposing I went out now and called in the police. I went to bed and let Paddock find the bunny and call them in the morning. What kind of story was I to tell about Scudder? The odds were a thousand to one that I would be charged. A thousand to one on, I would say. A thousand to one is a pretty long shot. But a thousand to one on. Absolutely. With the murder and the circumstantial evidence was strong enough to hang me. Mm, the bobby there looks pretty serious. Yeah. Alright, moving right along. Someone must have been searching for something. Perhaps for the pocketbook. Oh, oh cool, we can... All right, so we're searching the body. Ooh. Coins, nice English coins. Mm. George the fifth. Mm. Very good. Nice pocket knife. The knife. 
Life after Stonewall Jackson. Life of Stonewall Jackson. Now there's blood next to this chapter. A poor brief. interesting oh, cigar patch nice very good very good letters Carolides comes to London mm. I'll let you read those American agent suicide by gunshot oh yes that's the uh, mm. fake the death faking Collected killer's knife. Not seeing anything that's you know zooming. Okay. Must be. Here we go. And that's very hard to read. With all the blood spatter on it. Oh, hold on, we can show text. Ah. Dear Peter, was it Samuel Johnson who wrote when... You are tired of London, you are tired of life. Well, my dear Peter, if so, then I am tired of life. For here, and I am in London. So bored and at my wit's end. Ah, yes, we've seen this letter, I think. Uh, Queen Victoria medal. Nice. Ah, uh -huh. cute dog. Very cute. What is here, is it? Read those, all right. Well, let's just give us that for you. Yeah, no, this doesn't look like there's anything else to find here. I was hoping to find the pocketbook. And that just gives us the body. Yeah. Unless we've missed something. those There's nothing extra there that's that Okay, I think we've done everything. Well, I couldn't find anything more, so let's move right along. Ooh, we now have a view of the house. 
There was no trace of Scudder's black book. Most likely the enemies found it, but had but they had not found it on Scudder's body. I had come to a decision. I must vanish somehow. Keep vanished till the end of the second week of June. Then I must find a way to get in touch with the government people and tell them what Scudder had told me. I wish to heaven he had told me more and that I had listened more carefully to what he had told me. There was a big risk that even if I weathered the other dangers, I would not be believed. I must take my chance of that, and hope that something might happen which would confide my tale in the eyes of government. My notion was to get off to some wild district where my Veldcraft would be of some use to me, for I'd be like a trapped rat in the city. I considered that Scotland would be best, for my people were Scottish, and I could pass anywhere as an ordinary Scotsman. I fixed on Galloway as the best place to go. It was the nearest wild part of Scotland, and from the look of the map, it was not over thick with population. London, ooh, here we go. St Pancras, I've been there. London, St Pancras Station. Sunday morning, 7.10 train. Beautiful. How was I to wait, make my way to St Pancras train station? I was pretty certain that Scudder's friends would be watching from the outside. This puzzled me for a bit, then I had an inspiration, on which I went to bed and slept for two troubled hours. Waking up, I had a great revulsion of feeling and felt a God-forgotten fool. My inclination, inclination was to let things slide and trust to the British police taking a reasonable view of my case. But as I reviewed the situation, I could find no arguments to bring against my decision of the previous night. So, with a wry mouth, I resolved to go on with my plan. I hunted out a well-used tweed suit pair of strong nailed boots and a flannel shirt with a collar. Into my pockets I stuffed a spare shirt, a cloth cap, some handkerchiefs and a toothbrush. I took 50 pounds of it in sovereigns in a belt which I had brought back from Rhodesia. Oh, we got to huh, We got to shave. <laughs> That's cool. Now came the next step. Paddock used to arrive punctually at 7:30 and let himself in with a latch key. But about 20 minutes to 7, as I knew from bitter experience, 
The milkman turned up with a great clatter of cans and deposited my share outside my door. On him, I staked all my chances. I went into the darkened smoking room, where I breakfasted on a whiskey and soda and some biscuits. Mm. By this time, I was it was getting on for six o'clock. I put a pipe in my pocket and filled my pouch from the tobacco jar on the table by the fireplace. Where we find the pocketbook. Beautiful cloth bound, nice. Collected pocketbook. It seemed a good omen. Goodbye, old chap. I'm going to do my best for you. Wish me well. I hung about in the hall, waiting for the milkman. I was fairly choking to get out of his doors. <laughs> the fool had chosen this day to be late. All right, that's in the soup. All right, we can. Uh, we'll do one more. Let's go. Third-class citizen, wanted by the police for murder. And by the real killers for knowing too much. Her name is Flee London. Sunday, 24th May, 1914, Wimpole Street, London. Here we go, the milkman hath cometh. Oh, blimey! Come in here a moment. I want a word with you. Y y yes, sir. He was a young man, about of my own height with an ill-nourished moustache and wearing a flat blue cap and white overalls. I reckon you're a bit of a sportsman, and I want you to do me a service. Lend me your cap and overall for ten minutes, and here's a sovereign for you. His eyes opened at the sight of the gold, and he grinned broadly. What's the game? A bet. I have time to explain, but to win it... I've got to be a milkman for the next ten minutes, and all you've got to do is to stay here till I come back. You'll be a bit late, but nobody will complain, and you'll have that quid for yourself. Right, I ain't the man to spoil a bit of sport. Here's the rig, governor. Wearing his hat and overalls, I went whistling downstairs. At first, I thought there was nobody in the street. Then I caught sight of a policeman a hundred yards down, and a loafer shuffling past on the other side. I crossed the street in character, whistling gaily, and imitating the jaunty swing of the milkman. Some impulse made me raise my eyes to the house opposite, and there at the first window was a face. As the loafer passed, he looked up, and I fancied a signal was exchanged. Uh -huh, so they had people across the street. And I took the first side street. There was no one in the alleyway, so I dropped the milk cans inside the hoarding and sent the cap 
and overalls after them. I had only just put on my cloth cap when a postman came round the corner. I gave him good morning. He answered me unsuspiciously. Excellent. We're away! Then I took to my heels and ran. Oh, here we are, in London. Oh, Weymouth Street. Oh, oh, oh. Euston Road, oh, Euston Station. King's Cross, King's Cross St Pancras, here we go. It's a beautiful, beautiful station. Highly recommend it you go visit if you're in London. I had no time to take a ticket. The porter told me the platform. I saw the train already in motion. Two station officials blocked the way. I dodged them and clambered into the last carriage. I had made it. Ha ha. Awarded on the run. Go Richard. Good man. Three minutes later, an irate guard interviewed me. He wrote out for me a ticket to Newton Stewart, a name which had suddenly come back to my memory. Then, I, then he conducted me from the first-class compartment to a third-class smoker. The compartment was occupied by a sailor and a stout woman with a child. Ah, here we go. What's on in the pa ah, Empire Day Parade? Anything we need to worry about? Policeman on trial? Ooh. I'm not seeing anything I need to. Affairs in Berlin. Mm. New Minister Chill's Democratic Hopes. Harrods ad? Nice. Been there. Ah, it was the Empire Day celebrations. Ah, uh, yes. It's a sail job catching trains. Aye, the impudence of that geared. He needed a Scotch tongue to put him in his place. He was complaining of this way and no hain a ticket and her no fever till August 12 month. And he was objecting to this gentleman spitting. Well, we've now adopted a Scottish accent. I got a I've got <laughs> I have a couple of Scotty friends that I bowl with that uh, will object to me attempting to in the event of uh, yes I had a solemn time travelling north that day oh and then up through Birmingham nice up the Liverpool Manchester area I asked myself when I was still a free man had I stayed in London and not got the good out the good of I asked myself why, when I was still a free man, had I stayed on in London and not gone got the good of this heavenly country. Hmm. Ah, Manchester, very good. Then I got out Scudder's little pocketbook and studied it. Ooh, this ought to be interesting. I like the way they've done this. This is real. This is really cool. It's all in code. And you shizzle out of the lizzle.
the keyword. I tried for hours, but none of the words answered. Hmm. The writings. I was certain that Scudder never did anything without a reason. And I was pretty sure there was a cipher in all of this. I have a head for things like chess and puzzles. And I used to reckon myself pretty good at finding out ciphers. These sets of figures look like they correspond to letters of the alphabet. Manchester, Carlisle, so we're now in Scotland. Ooh, beautiful train. North British Railroad. I woke up at Dumfriars, just in time to bundle out onto the crowded platform. There was a young man on the platform whose looks I didn't like, but he never glanced at me. I caught sight of myself in the mirror and an automatic machine oh, of an automatic machine with my brown face, my old tweed and my slouch. I was the very model of one of the hill farmers who were now crowding into the third class carriages. Oh, we've now got to a little green train. Nice. I boarded the Galway, Galway train, travelling with half a dozen in an atmosphere of shag and clay pipes. Nice. They'd come from the weekly market and their mouths were full of prices. Half, about half of the men had lunched heavily and were highly flavoured with whiskey. They took no notice of me. I heard accounts of how the lambing had gone up. How the lambing had gone up the can and the dudes. And a dozen other mysterious waters. Excellent. About five o'clock the carriage had emptied and I was left alone as I hoped. I got out at the next station. <laughs> it, ri it reminded me of one of those forgotten little stations in the Karoo. An old station master with his spade over his shoulder sauntered to the train, took charge of a parcel and went back to his potatoes. While a child of ten received my ticket. Hmm, there's a path over here. Hmm. Oh, look, the Scottish Highlands. Ah, to be in the Scottish Highlands on a day like this. We make sure there's uh, nothing to. Nothing to uh, see, no water, oh, just onwards. Onwards! Always onwards! A farmhouse, around dusk. I was v getting very hungry when I eventually came to a herd's cottage. A brown-faced woman greeted me with the, kindly, with the kindly shyness of the moorland places. When I asked for a night's lodging, she said I was welcome the bed in the loft, and very soon she set before me a hearty meal of ham and eggs, scones, and thick sweet milk. At the darkening, her man came in from the hills, a lean giant, who in one step covered as much ground as three paces of ordinary mortals. They asked me no questions, for they had the perfect reading of all dwellers in the wild. But I could see they set me down as a kind of dealer. I took some trouble to con <laughs> to confirm their view. They refused any payment, and by six the next morning I had breakfasted and was striding southward again.
all the slackness of the past month was slipping from my bones, and I stepped out like a four-year-old. <laughs> my notion was to re return to the railway line station, or too farther on than the place w where I had alighted yesterday, and to double back. I waited till I saw the smoke of an east going train on the horizon. Then I approached the booking office and took a, t a ticket for Dumfries. Alrighty. So that's next next thing next chapter is going to be the sanctuary of the inn. So I'm going to leave this episode here. I want to thank you all for joining me. If you enjoyed this episode of The 39 Steps and the continuing tale of Richard Hanny and his attempts to uh, escape London, save, save, a uh, save a politician from assassination and all the intrigue that goes with it, please uh, leave a like, thumbs up, all that good stuff. If you're new to the channel and want to see more of this and any, all the other games we do, Please subscribe as well. Hit the notification icon so that way when there's new videos you get a little reminder. Uh, and comments, please feel free feel, please feel free to leave comments. Your support is so greatly appreciated. So yeah. Thanks again for joining us and until next time. Latest. <laughs>